Hi there. Uh, in this video, we're going to be going through a backend setting in IV. Um, so without further ado, let's get to it. Um, so quite a short section, so hopefully not a too long video. Um, so the first thing is that um, there's two different ways of us using the backend or setting the backend. So first of all, um, we can explicitly set the backend by calling IV.setBackend. Um, and this is generally the way we advise to do it. It's very clear in the code. This is the backend I want to be using. It's also more efficient if you're not compiling the code because we have to do a few less checks during the forward pass. Um, but if you want to just dive straight in without choosing your backend and keep things very dynamic, that's okay. Um, the, the backend can also just be inferred from the input arguments directly. Um, and then in this case, we, we have, um, in the latter case, we do have another global variable, which is called the implicit backend. It's completely separate from the explicit backend. So um, it's purely used when we're doing this implicit mode. And um, the only time it kicks in, I think this is probably what's being explained here. Um, yeah, I mean, I can explain this in words, basically. Um, the explicit backend always overrides the implicit backend, and if we set the backend, this is the only thing that's going to be run. If we set the backend to torch and pass it a TensorFlow tensor, it's going to throw an error because we're going to be passing TensorFlow tensors into a PyTorch function. Um, whereas if we um, pass in a PyTorch tensor, uh, yeah, PyTorch tensor, and then call a TensorFlow tensor, that's fine. It's just going to be like, oh, okay, uh, what are these arguments this time? Oh, it's TensorFlow. Let's call TensorFlow. The only reason we need an implicit backend. Um, as a global variable is so that we can enable, for example, um, somebody to pass in a PyTorch tensor into a function and then call the function iv.1s or iv.0s after that. And we want to be able to remember, oh, okay, they passed in PyTorch tensors a moment ago. They probably want us to generate a PyTorch tensor of ones. And this is then what, what's useful. And we can't do the normal approach of inferring it from the input arguments because there are no arrays in the input arguments to ones. We just pass a shape. Um, so that's where the implicit backend is useful. Um, in addition to that, by default, we initialize the implicit backend as NumPy, which means if somebody does import IV, x equals IV.1s, straight away, we're not going to throw an error for them. We can let them play around um, straight away. So, and then they'll get a, a, a return of NumPy arrays. Um, so it should then, be impossible to kind of break things without setting a backend. And you can just keep playing around in implicit mode and it will always kind of choose the right backend for you. Um, any questions on the implicit backend setting at all? No, okay. Um, and I just want to make sure this is what I've just said. Um, yeah, that's pretty much what I just said. So now we can talk about what the backend setting does. Um, so when calling this function, so we have this set backend function. The question is, what are we doing when we call set backend? So the first thing we do is we store a global copy of the unmodified original IV dict into this variable called IV original dict if it's not already been stored. So um, is it here? No. <laughs> Oops. Uh, so yeah, I mean, if, if uh, we don't have this, then we, we store basically the IV dict, which includes all of the um, uh, functions which are implemented in the IV folder, which have IV.current backend dot function name, etc. cetera. Um, then we import the backend module, which is for example, IV.functional.backends.torch. Um, so we pass that in. Um, all functions in this backend module are primary functions. Um, this is because we only have primary functions directly in name. That's kind of by definition. We said a primary function is a function which has a backend specific implementation. And that's exactly what is stored in these files and folders. So, so now what we get is a, a, um, a module which has only the primary functions um, without any of the compositional functions. Then what we do is we loop through the original IV dict, which has all of the functions, including the compositional functions, and we add the primary function from the back end if it exists. Otherwise, we add the compositional version from the IV original dict. And we go through every function in the IV original dict, and I mean, where is this logic? Um, 
You might not follow it through exactly, but yeah, we go. So we go through every key and value in the original dictionary. Um, if k, if, if the the function name, which is the key, is not in the backend, um, is not in the backend dict, which means it's compositional, then we add v, which is the the. So this is the function name and the function itself. Um, so if it's not in the back end, which means it's not a primary one, then we will add this V, which is the compositional one, so that we still have that function there. Um, and then, yeah, there's a bit more complicated stuff, um, but that's the main piece of logic. And then eventually we add this to the Ivy dict. So that basically we are now overwriting the global Ivy, which is import Ivy and everything that's accessible from this. This is overwritten whenever we call a line of code like this. And this is updated everywhere in every file. Um, it's a global Ivy name. It's the module itself. And in Python, when you import a module, every time you re-import it in another file somewhere, if it's already been imported, it kind of ignores that line and it just references the original global import. So this is why updating this is updating it everywhere in every file. Um, so we replace it with the backend specific V, which is either the primary function or the compositional one. Uh, and that's that. Um, we then wrap the functions where necessary. So we call this wrap function helper um, if it's a callable. So some of these are like constants or, or data types because it's not only functions in the dict. Um, we might have um, like, yeah, data types or constants. So if it's a function, then we wrap that function and the wrap function logic basically goes through all of the decorators that we have. It looks at the original function, it sees, was this decorator applied? And if it was, then we make sure it's added, um, basically. So we kind of make sure we rewrap the backend functions like torch ABS in the backend, um, sorry, not torch ABS, we, we rewrap our Ivy backend version of ABS in the torch folder um, with all the correct decorators. Um, which is what this wrap function does. Um, yeah. So again, it's, uh, in wrapping, we do this to avoid code duplication. There's a lot of repeated logic, such as handling the devices, handling the data types, converting to and from native and, I and IV arrays. And this is what all of the decorators are doing. Um, and again, this is explained in much more detail in the next section, which will be the next video. So I won't dive too deeply into this right now. Um, so we then have one example. Basically, we start with an array. Uh, we can then get the backend. Well, this is an example of calling ivy.get backend. Um, actually, this might, no, no, sorry. No, this is, this is correct. So this is showing how we do it in implicit mode. So the backend currently being used is the implicit version. Um, now, if we, um, now, if we uh, pass in two torch tensors and then we get the backend, we have torch. Um, so again, just showing how NumPy is the default implicit backend. PyTorch then is, is inferred and is, is kind of stored in memory if we then pass PyTorch tensors. Um, this is only the implicit backend though. Um, and then if we set the backend um, explicitly as jacks and we pass these in, we get jacks. Um, and if we unset the backend then and get it again, we have torch because this is memorized from the, the one before. Um, okay, so yeah. Um, and this is, yeah, so the implicit backend is always used as a fallback basically. Um, the implicit backend is always used as a fallback if the backend stack is empty. Um, yeah, okay, so so anyway, so this hopefully gives you a good idea of, of, um, of what, of how we do the backend setting and how the backend is enabled, give you an idea of what kind of implicit mode means and what explicit mode means, um, explained really importantly what happens when we call ivy.setBackend um, and how we overwrite the global ivy dictionary and how we populate the global ivy dictionary correctly with the backend specific primary functions and keep the compositional functions that we need as well. Um, there was a bit more logic I can quickly explain because it just kind of came to me. Maybe it wasn't in this commit hash, but um, but we also need to remove, yeah, it is. So um, if there's, um, so here we go. So this is something else that's just interesting to look at. So um, if K is not in the backend dict, um, but it is in the backend 
the key is in the back end invalid data types, then we need to remove the um, we need to remove the data type. That's what it means. It's a data type that is not supported. We need to remove it from Ivy's dict entirely. So just for example, like we we start off having um, Ivy dot is it here? I think so. Yeah, we have Ivy dot uint Ivy dot float sixteen. All of these things are are defined on the global Ivy namespace. But if the back end does not support them, then we should not have them on the, I, the global Ivy namespace because that suggests that they're supported. So all we need to do basically here um, is, um, yeah, I mean, this is not really explained in this section actually, but I thought it's quite interesting to, to explain as well. Um, we, we just make sure that we delete it because we shouldn't be having ivy.float16 if we have a backend set that doesn't support float16. Um, so that's just another little piece of logic that's relevant. Uh, this stuff is a bit more complicated. Um, I think it's not really worth diving into everything in a, in a short explanation video, but by all means, feel free to run through the code and try and work out what everything's doing. Um, okay, anyway, I think that will do. It's been a good length, I think. Um, so before we end, any questions on the backend setting at all from anybody? No, okay, awesome. Well, hopefully that means that everything is well explained and not just terribly explained and everyone's completely lost. I'll, I'll be optimistic and assume the former is, is true. Um, okay, well, thank you very much for watching and I will see you all in the next video. Bye for now.